And again, appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, we're going to divert. Um, I, I was trying to be clever when I posted this online. We're going to take a detour off our usual World's Fair route. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, Don Lancaster has been uh, very gracious to talk about Route 66. And uh, we can debate at the end of the, the thing if it's Route or Route 66. But, uh, <laughs> it's a talk that I'm looking forward to. We, Carol and I took the kids and my parents a number of years ago and drove basically the second half of, of the route. Uh, Don's going to take us pretty much through the first half of the route today. But uh, to me, the whole thing is really fascinating because 100 years ago, this was a massive new thing of, you know, the first interstate highway to take people across the United States. And I, uh, Carol can tell you, I've always had a fascination for how we were just watching something on TV last night. They were talking about, you know, a major iron uh, factory in England and how it's now just ruins. And it's always fascinating to me how civilization moves on, you know, things that are the latest and greatest uh, you know, thing in uh, one period and 10 years later, it's a ghost town. So um, Don's going to be giving the talk. I'm going to be playing the, uh, the moderator on the side. We're going to mute everybody uh, again, just like in other weeks. If you have a question, you can stick them into the uh, uh, chat. Uh, Don will try to answer as many of the things as you can at the end. If there's anything urgent, let me know and we'll, we'll try to look at it. Uh, but again, uh, Don is in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, he's uh, taken several trips on Route 66. He gave me previews the other day, and I think folks are going to find it uh, kind of fascinating to see, uh, you know, see how the mother road has changed. So here is, take it away, Don. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm in the process. I'll do it after the presentation. Uh, I was getting ready to put a reading list up there. Uh, well, hang on. I, I made a mistake. Uh, we just unmuted Don when I muted everybody else. So Don, <laughs> so. I just thought you thought it would be a better presentation without me talking. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it before. I was trying to do everybody a favor, but no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just want to let you folks know after the presentation, I'm going to be posting a, a, a an introductory reading list on Route 66. I meant to do it just before we got started, but hadn't done it. So, and I don't want to take the time to work out whatever's going wrong right now. So we'll get, we'll do that a little later, but if you're interested in some of the history and uh, where we found some of this information, I have a few books that you might want to have a look at, but let's go ahead and get my presentation shared with you folks. One second. Let me get that off the screen and here we go. All right. Can you see the route 66 slide there? Yes, sir. Is there a, okay, there we go. That gets the rest of it off. All righty. So uh, for those of you who don't know me or usually just tune in for the World's Fair stuff, my name is Don Lancaster. I'm a sort of an armchair historian. Uh, my wife and I have had a passion for Route 66 for about 10 years now, and we've always wanted, we always wanted to explore it. So we spent a lot of time researching it, and we actually have spent about six weeks on the route. We've done two trips, one three-week trip for the first half and one three-week trip for the second half. We average about 100 miles a day when we travel. I annoy my wife because every time we go 100 feet, oh, look, another ruin. I go out and snap 500 pictures and we move on. Uh, so we we, uh, we like to do it very slowly. We like to take our time. We like to talk to the people along the route. Uh, I've taken over 12,000 photos of the route over those two trips. You won't have to see all of them today. We'll do less than 2%. Uh, all the photos you see are my own, uh, just to avoid copyright issues. So you're not going to see much in the way of historical photos. Everything you see today is the way the route pretty much exists as it stands right now. Um, if you've ever been down the route before, I apologize if I don't cover your favorite spot. When Bill asked me to do this, I put a presentation presentation together on the entire length of the route and quickly discovered that unless you wanted to retire during my presentation, it was way too long. Uh, I trimmed it down to the first half, but even then I'm covering less than 10% of the things we saw and the stories we know. Uh, so this is sort of an introduction. The route is an endless rabbit hole when you travel. And yes, it is root, Bill, root. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's so much to see and so much to know. Uh, when I first started looking at this stuff, I read a quote that said, the currency of Route 66 is story. So I'm going to try to tell the story of the route through the stories that we've learned along the way. We'll also stop at some of the cheap tour stops and such things. You know, everybody likes the giant dinosaurs and things. Uh, but 
half of the route is understanding you pass this old building. Well, that building is actually very important and we'll talk about why. So, and again, I'll, I'll post a reading list when we get to the end. When we travel, my wife, by the way, is sitting to the right. She's not normally here for, with me on the presentation and requested to stay off camera, but she is my live fact checker. So if you hear a slapping sound, that is me being reminded that I didn't give the right town or something like that. Uh, when we travel, we carry two guidebooks that I will have in the reading list, plus a book that we compile from about a year's worth of research before we take each trip uh, that tells us about uh, alignments and things that and nobody else has ever known. So Mandy serves as navigator, keeping us on route. She has the hard job. I just drive. I have the easy job. Um, but all that research pays off because it helps us, you know, to get a sense of where we're going, what happened. Uh, quick history of the route. Uh, the route actually had its very first road on the route it was actually created in 1857. Uh, but it had nothing to do with with the highway. It was created by Lieutenant Ed, uh, Edward Beale. Uh, he was under command to create a wagon trail west of the town called Cajun in California to test pack an uh, camels as pack animals. Now that test failed, but the wagon trail still remained. And for a while, it was part of Route 66. So that makes it the oldest alignment on the route. I don't know if you can still get to it. We have never seen that stretch. The route proper actually came into existence in 1925 when they began to look for a way to connect Chicago to Los Angeles. We needed a east-west th thoroughfare. Cars were just coming into their own at that point, and there was no east-west route. They needed some way to connect the roads and call it Route 66 so people could easily navigate, and it was marked clearly at each intersection which way you went to stay on the route. It was made up at that time mostly of three highways, uh, one called the Lone Star Route, another one called the National Old Trails Route, and another one called the Ozark Trail System. That covered about half of it. The rest was connected basically by committee. Uh, various towns would vote and say they would want the route to come to their town because it brought a lot of money to a town. That actually became a problem a little later on. Uh, but the amount of commerce that would come to a town once Route 66 was going full swing meant boom times for any town that had a route pass through it. So they would have the route actually pass right through the center of their downtown sections. And there are lots of towns along the route now abandoned, that had the route right go right through town square. Okay, I cannot overstate the importance of the route in the 20th century. This was the way to travel east and west in the country until the interstate system came into being. In its golden age, the route's traffic was massive, so much so that it did cause problems for towns along the route. And we'll look at how they dealt with them. But then suddenly the interstate highway was introduced and things got a little bad. Like overnight, when they would open up a section of interstate, you would go from hundreds of thousands of cars a day to zero, as if someone flipped a switch. And this was devastating for the economies in the reason region. There were lots of reasons why they would move the route from one place to another, the interstate highway system being the most well known. But sometimes another town simply outbid you. They wanted the money. And so if they paid more money than you did to have the route, they would move the route away from your town and over into another town and take all the traffic with it. So as you travel down the route, you discover sections where the route was realigned. They came up with a new road. These are called alignments. There are lots and lots of old alignments for Route 66. You'll hear me use that term a lot. If you're traveling from Chicago to LA, you need a book that will tell you just where the alignments are because in some places there will be four or five alternate alignments of the route, each one having its own history, its own tours, traps, and uh, towns. So it's, it gets to be a challenge. That's one of the reasons we travel with those books is so we can pick which alignments we wanna see. Sometimes we'll double back and do three or four alignments. Uh, this is an old alignment of Route 66. It's out in the desert. We won't be doing the desert portion today. But you have a lot of sections like this. Some are completely cut off and you have to you know, drive down some pretty cheesy dirt roads to get to them. This one is no longer available. Uh, you have to know where you can catch a dirt road and then drive over brush and such to get to these things. Many of them are still available. People still live on them, but no one drives on them anymore. Now the route went through about four different ages. Uh, the earliest age was after it was built, just before the depression, when they were still connecting all the roads together. And that time it was mostly dirt roads and mostly single lane dirt roads. But as we ended into the thirties and the Dust Bowl and the depression hit, 
uh, let me go back here, uh, people from Kansas and Oklahoma and some in Missouri suddenly found themselves without any source. Their, their farms were gone, the depression had killed them, they'd lost their homes, banks had repossessed. And so they took the route from Oklahoma and Kansas to Los Angeles seeking jobs that weren't there, unfortunately. This was the time period that the Grapes of Wrath was made about. And if you've never seen that movie and you wanna learn the history of Route 66, that is the place to start. Most of Route 66, uh, most of Grapes of Wrath was filmed on location in the various places along Route 66. And so a lot of what I talk about today, you will see in that movie, including the treacherous Jericho Gap. Uh, fortunately, after the war ended and the depression was over, Things got a little bit better and the route entered its golden age. People had more money in their pockets and they wanted to travel and automobiles were more readily available. And they began to travel to California on vacations. And this was when the route became absolutely packed to the gills. So much so that people were unable to cross the street in some towns. And a lot of times the cars didn't even respect traffic lights. Uh, uh, yes, and my wife reminds me of there's a Disney connection here. Uh, at one point in time, uh, Walt Disney actually increased traffic significantly on the route by opening a little thing called Disneyland. This was the main way to travel from the east to get to Disneyland, and they actually can measure a significant uptick in traffic due to Walt Disney. So this was the golden age of the route, uh, starting in the late 50s and or, or mid 50s and going pretty much through the late 70s. But while that was happening, the death of the route had already been begun because Eisenhower proposed the interstate highway system. He wanted a quick and easy way to cross the country. Didn't want to have to go through small towns. He wanted a way also to move the military. A lot of people didn't know that. So we began to build a massive network of interstate highways. They mostly in this section, right along here, they follow the route in parallel or went right on top of it. But in many cases, they would go off about five or 10 miles from the route. And when those sections were completed and opened, the traffic would go to massive amounts to zero and the towns and tourist traps and all those suddenly had no economy at all. And I can't tell you how dramatic the, input was, uh, the impact was. There are entire ghost towns out there that died because of the interstate. So, up until 1985, this process continued. Around 1985, we closed the last section or completed the last section of the interstate and Route 66 was officially decommissioned, at which point it began a period of time everyone assumed it was pretty much dead. And if we were to go into the desert section right now, I can show you, you know, some incredible old ruins. Maybe we'll do a part two of this later on. Uh, but everyone assumed it had died and, you know, there wasn't any, any bringing it back. However, that wasn't true. Around oh, year 2000, late 1990s, the route was rediscovered. A lot of people wanted to show their kids the history they'd experienced. A lot of people simply just wanted to travel down the route one more time and learn what was there. And a tourist boom began. This happens mostly during the summer. And there's become a massive interest. One of the reasons I'm giving this is uh, you know, in traveling the route and learning the history and seeing what remains. Uh, and a matter of fact, it became such a big boom. Whoops, you don't travel that road anymore. Uh, it became such a big boom that people from Europe learned about it and discovered an important part of our history. And now people from Europe and some folks from Japan we've encountered, they'll call tours, uh, tour guides in Chicago who will rent them Mustangs or motorcycles and they send them off down the road in packs with a tour guide and they guide them down the entire route uh, usually they take about a week and a week and a half to do it so they can see our history. Uh, we've actually gotten in with some of these. It's uh, kind of overwhelming. It's very hard to get a picture. Uh, I have stopped at several places on the route where I haven't heard a word of English spoken. So Route 66 has become very popular, not just here, but across the world, and people are coming to see it. Um, if you've never been on Route 66, this, this tour may surprise you. Some people expect to, uh, to see a very different thing, mostly because they've watched the show Route 66, which wasn't filmed on Route 66. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we'll give you a good idea of what's still there and what the history is. So let's go ahead and get in our car and head off down south from Chicago where the whole thing begins. Route 66 begins just north of the lake in Chicago and heads directly through downtown. Now this section of the route is not all that interesting in my mind. There are some famous Route 66 stops here, mostly restaurants and steakhouses, but I'm not gonna include them here, one, because we didn't really get a chance to visit many of them. 
And two, they're more modern than they are Route 66. A lot of them have been rebuilt and such. The sprawl of Chicago has wiped out most of the traces of the early route. And it isn't until you get about 50 miles south that those traces begin to appear. And this is one of them. I talked to you about alternate alignments. Well, this is one of the first alignments of Route 66. It's a one lane dirt road down in Illinois. Uh, you'll notice that there are banks on either side. So if traffic came up in either direction, if you met another car coming the other way, you had a problem. Uh, you had to, well, somebody had to back up sometimes for a mile or so before he could pass. This was what most of early Route 66 looked like until the highway department said, you know what, we need two lane roads and we need them paved. Well, that was a problem because this happened during the depression and a lot of cities and towns and states didn't have enough money to pave two lane roads. So what they would do is put in two lane roads as far as they could and then pave the remaining, remaining one lane road. Uh, that was enough to make the highway department happy. So you ended up getting these one lane roads with very wide shoulders. What I wanna point out here, if you notice these stripes on either side, this is the lane going down. Those were curbs and the early Route 66 had these curves on either side of their paved roads, all in the Northern part. That was supposed to make the route easier to travel and keep you on the road, but it had a bad effect because cars in the 1930s did not have the best alignment and they tended to drift. And if you drifted into one of these curbs, it would grab your wheel and toss you across the road in the opposite direction. If there happened to be a car coming the other way, you had a problem. Or if you were in a one lane road, you can see that there were ditches, you could end up tossed into the side of the road. They eventually stopped you, they called them deadly curves. So you can imagine why they stopped using them. But if you find a stretch of Route 66 that has these curbs in one lane, you're looking at one of the older stretches that probably was built early in the depression era. If you couldn't afford to pave your Route 66, well, no problem, you could just put bricks down. And there are several sections in the Northern part of Route 66 that are still bricked. Um, this happens to be a two lane section. I want you to notice in both the last pictures, you didn't see another automobile. We're about 20 miles from an interstate here on one of the older alignments of Route 66. I stood in the middle of this road for half an hour doing a photo shoot. I did not encounter another soul for that entire half hour. I'll give you an idea of just how badly the realignments hurt, even during tourist season in the middle of summer, I didn't see another car. And that happened a lot as I traveled down the routes. But I found it fascinating that we still have some of these old brick sections, which are basically an answer to the problem of not having enough money to do what the highway department wanted. And now we'll start with the cheesier stuff. Route 66 is famous for its large figures, large statues and such. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of them over time but some of them still remain. And some of the most famous ones are called muffler men. You probably have a muffler man in your community. They were created to advertise mufflers and auto repair, uh, muffler shops and auto repair shops. You could order them and they'd come holding a large muffler in their hands. Uh, and you know, after a couple of years, the people making them said, you know what, we don't have to just put mufflers there. Uh, so they would sell you a muffler man holding whatever you wanted him to hold. And some were also retrofitted. Uh, this is one of the more famous ones. He's in Atlanta, Illinois. I'm not sure why he's holding a hot dog. I'll need to research that. But uh, you see muffler men holding all sorts of things as you travel or travel down the route. This is the most photographed muffler uh, man on the route. He's known as the Gemini Giant. Uh, over to the right, just off camera, is a, a drive through restaurant called The Launching Pad. Uh, it's been abandoned for a long time. It's not very photogenic, so I didn't snap a picture of it. But just another example, uh, there are actually websites where you can learn where every muffler man on the site is. And now let's start off to some of the classic old Route 66 businesses. As we head south down the route in Illinois, come to a town called Pontiac and the Old Log Cabin Inn. The Old Log Cabin Inn was actually built in 1948. And it's not a very impressive place and not many people think much about it when they see it, but what makes it interesting is its story. Because when it was built, it originally faced Route 66 and got a great deal of business as we came out of World War II and headed into the Golden Age. But a couple of years after it was built, the highway department announced yet another realignment and they moved Route 66 from the front of the restaurant to the back of the restaurant. Now this restaurant didn't have easy access from the back and it wasn't very pretty in the back. So they really worried about what this, what this was going to do to their business. 
But rather than shut down, they decided to make lemonade out of lemons. They called the town together, had a huge celebration in the parking lot and brought in several giant cranes. And the town watched as the whole restaurant was lifted off its foundation, rotated 180 degrees and set right back down again where it sits today, now with its front side facing the restaurant again. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> yes. My wife tells me it doesn't face the restaurant, it faces Route 66. Mm -hmm. Nearby in Litchfield is the Ariston. This is perhaps the oldest restaurant in the route. I'm not certain of that yet. Certainly the oldest restaurant in this part of the route. It was built in 1924 and moved to its current location on 66 in 1935. Um, they had a similar problem as the log cabin in where they realigned the highway from the front to the back. Rather than move it, they simply did the smarter thing. They put the signs where you see them now. They built this little porch and you know, Bob's your uncle. This is suddenly the front of the restaurant. Um, when Mandy and I were traveling down the route, we came up with an award system called the Donna Mandy Route 66 Adventure Awards. Uh, this actually has two of our awards, best chicken livers on the route, my wife is a big chicken liver fan, and best chocolate cake on the route. Pulling into Springfield, Illinois, uh, which is mostly serious attractions, but as we pulled in, we had a long, hard day. We discovered that even the giant figures on Route 66 can have a hard day. And we found this elephant enjoying a martini not far from us, just along the route. Of course, Springfield is known for Lincoln, and this is where his law offices are located. His library is located here. They have an exceptional museum here. Uh, for those of you who are theme park fans, and that's most of us, I suspect, I highly recommend you visit this museum because the last two shows in the museum feature some amazing Pepper's Ghost work using the same technology that was used in the Mystery Lodge at Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, they're very, very well done. I won't give away the surprise endings, but they are, I highly recommend them, especially if you enjoy the Mystery Lodge at Knott's Berry Farm. And that's a great way to learn history. Uh, Lincoln lived here much of his life. He raised his family here. He left here to go to the White House to become president, and his home is still located here right off the route. Uh, it's, in, it's the original home. All the homes around it are original to the era as well. Inside, you'll find Lincoln's original furniture. They kept all the furniture. Most of the possessions on display are his as well. The wallpaper is even original, and what we've learned from this is his wife really had no taste whatsoever. Uh, there, if you go into the bedroom and you see the wallpaper, you wonder how the man ever slept. Um, in the kitchen, there is an old stove that Lincoln gave to his wife as a gift, and she loved it so much that when they moved to the White House, they moved the stove to the White House with them, and when he was assassinated, she had it brought back here. Uh, you can take tours of this and you know, get a good sense of what life was like for Lincoln before he moved to Washington. His tomb is also located nearby, about five miles down the road. All righty, another form of the road that I hadn't talked about because I was waiting for this slide. One of the most common ones, especially in the Southwest, is concrete slabs. They'd come in and they'd pour a slab of concrete, then they'd pour one right next to it, et cetera. They were actually disconnected, so as the road expanded and moved, you didn't have a cracking. They just, you know, sort of moved along with it. Very, very popular. Route 66 affectionados love these because as you pass from slab to slab, you get a little kadoom, kadoom, kadoom. It's known as the Route 66 lullaby, and it's really relaxing. But this particular slab is probably the most famous. This is in Girard. Um, and what happened was after they poured the slab, when they weren't looking, a turkey came along and decided to dance on the concrete. And his turkey prints are recorded right here on the concrete. We've actually, they've actually painted a white box around them. And as you're coming up on Girard along this route, there are signs that say five miles to the turkey prints, one mile to the turkey prints. You know you're in the middle of nowhere when bird prints and concrete is a big attraction, but it is on Route 66. We stopped to, to get a picture anyway. This is the town of Girard. And I mentioned earlier that when Route 66 was realigned, it was really hard on little towns like these. Uh, you're actually seeing more cars here than you normally would. Mandy and I have driven through a great number of these town squares along Route 66, and most of the time there is no one there. No cars, no people, no businesses. It's like dropping back into the twilight zone. Here there are a few cars for one reason. There is one restaurant that remains here in Girard. And that restaurant is Doc's Diner, which used to be a drugstore. Doc's Soda Fountain, thank you. Used to be a drugstore. 
when the route was realigned and the town began to die, the man who owned it said, you know what, I'm not going to go down with this. He closed his drugstore and he made a museum out of it. Uh, and there's also a dining room there, but he kept the soda fountain open. And this is the original soda fountain. You can see the marble counter. Unfortunately, the lo uh, lower part here is not period, but the marble counter is and everything else is. Um, so people came in to see the museum to, to grab a quick lunch. It's very well known along the route. It won the Don and Mandy uh, uh, Route 66 Adventure Awards for best root beer float. And if you're in Girard, it's well worth your time. Moving out of Girard, we're getting ready to head into Missouri. I could not go on this bridge because we couldn't get to it in the weather. By the time we actually found it, it was pouring rain, so I wasn't able to take a picture. So this is from uh, Google Earth. The way into uh, St. Louis changed over the years as the alignments moved, but the longest one was over this bridge called the Chain of Rocks Bridge. The Chain of Rocks Bridge is well known because right here in the middle, it took a 22 degree turn to the right, which on foggy days could be quite surprising for some drivers. Uh, they had some challenges right here. The Chain of Rocks Bridge was only two lanes wide and people didn't always know that there was a turn coming. Eventually the traffic became too much for it to bear during the golden age and they built another bridge which eventually became the interstate up here in the north. Um, but the Chain of Rocks Bridge remained and it was abandoned and eventually the town decided it was too important and they've since converted it into a pedestrian bridge where runners and joggers can jog. Over here on the far left hand side of the screen you're going to see this curving road that comes down and an area to the north of it right there. That is where the Chain of Rocks Bridge Amusement Park uh, was. It's long since gone, but the Chain of Rocks Bridge was such a big thing along the route that someone actually built an amusement park there that prospered for many years. Uh, now, St. Louis itself has more than anyone could cover uh, in any presentation, so I'm just going to touch on a few things. Um, if you're interested in trains, by the way, I don't have pictures. The old Union Station here, which was the main train station for Central America, has been converted to a hotel, and you can stay there for train lovers. But the biggest thing we remember about Route 66 is this Ted Drew's restaurant. Ted Drew's serves custard, frozen custard. It is loved by the people of uh, St. Louis, and it's famous for the tour, uh, to the tourists. It was built originally in 1931, moved to its original, uh, moved here to its location on Route 66 in 1941, and has been a huge hit ever since. If you go to St. Louis, you have to have Ted Drew's, but let me warn you. You need to get there early. It opens usually around 10 o'clock. This was about quarter of 10 when we showed up. Around quarter of 10, the neighbors start coming out and they start forming lines. Now, if you look, there's windows all around this thing. I think there were 12 of them in total. In less than an hour, there will be lines longer than the one you see at each and every one of those windows when tourists and the neighbors come in and it will stay that way the entire day. So you want to try some Ted Cruz, but you really want to get there early. Otherwise, you're going to have a very long wait to get it. For those of you who love carousels, just south of the route in, in, uh, in St. Louis, there's an antique Denzel carousel, one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen. This particular one was built in 1921 when purchased by a park in St. Louis for $30,000. But about 15 years ago, it was getting dilapidated and the city decided to save it. They built a dedicated building for it, completely refurbished it top to the bottom. It's in absolutely spectacular condition. It is one of the most gorgeous carousels I've ever seen. And the people who work on it do it as a labor of love. It's an all volunteer team. It's only a, about five minutes off the route. Well worth your time. Getting back on the main route, we move out of St. Louis and we come to the most boring name museum I've ever heard of, the Museum of Transportation. Why would you want to go there? Well, the reason is, uh, like many of the people here, people love trains. And this is the train museum. They have over 70 full trains, locomotive to caboose. They have an additional 140 partial trains, either to caboose a car or just the engine, making a, a huge, huge display of, of uh, locomotives and trains. It can take easily the full day to see it. This one Mandy is standing next to here is an example of the big boy locomotives. Uh, this thing weighed 600 tons and is 132 feet long. That's just the locomotive. It could get up to speeds of 80 miles an hour, and it's the world's largest successful steam loco. Um, it was used to haul freight over the mountains between Cheyenne, 
Wyoming and Ogden, Utah. Of these, only eight survive and only one is operational. So if you want to see one, this is a really good place to see it. They will let you climb up in the cab and have a look around. Uh, I was completely lost. <laughs> the, the complexity of that locomotive was just astounding. I grabbed a picture of this, uh, this train mostly because it reminded me of Bob Gurr's Viewliner. It looks a lot like it. Uh, this is an aerial train. It was built for the Rock Island Line. Uh, we're going to discover a bit later that the Rock Island Line and Route 66 are really tied together. Um, this thing ran from 1955 into the 60s, but it was not quite wide enough. And so it was really unstable. It would shake and rattle when it got up to speed. So it wasn't very popular. And it was eventually discontinued and put here. And this is just a boring old freight loco uh, or diesel locomotive, nothing to uh, recommend it. I took the picture because it was just so darn proud of being radio equipped. Yes, folks, you're looking at the train of the future right here. Radio equipped, uh, apparently that was a new technology when this was put in. So I, I just was impressed by how proud they were of that. Um, there was a line of railroads built for the Burlington route called the Zephyrs. This is the last of the Zephyrs. This is the General Pershing Zephyr uh, used to run on the, on the um, Great Northern and the uh, CB&Q uh, as, as a commuter rail. I loved it because it was art deco and it's very streamlined. If you've been to Chicago, there's one of these in the Museum of Science and Industry. There are several others on display across the country, but I just happen to love the Zephyrs. They're just such beautiful trains. Now the museum actually does have more than just trains. Uh, for example, they have a lot of antique automobiles. This Corvette was just you know amazing. But I didn't take this picture for the Corvette. I took it for the display behind it. Behind it is the Coral Court Motel. Now the Coral Court was famous in its day uh, for being you know, a gorgeous Art Deco motel. It was built in 1941 and had these wonderful yellow and black tiles with glass bricks. But the thing that really made it famous was this garage off to the side, because you see, you could pull up and if you weren't in a convertible, you could pull inside, close the garage door, enter your room from the inside and no one could see who came into the room with you. This made the Coral Court really popular for, shall we say, illicit, illicit meetings, maybe uh, uh, you know, a nice uh, romantic meeting that you didn't want anyone else to know about, perhaps a shady business deal. Uh, and you could, pretty much get anonymity. Problem with that is it gave the place a seedy reputation. After a while, the tourists began to stay away. Then the route was realigned and the car stopped coming. It was abandoned and there were efforts to save it, but somebody tore the whole thing down and built an office plaza on top of it. Fortunately, the Museum of Transportation stepped in and preserved one of the cabins that we have here uh, so that we see at least what one of the cabins was like. The Coral Court is legendary. There are entire books written on the things that happened at the Coral Court. And all up and down Route 66, you can't swing a cat without hitting a Route 66 museum. And almost every last one of them will have a display on the Coral Court. This came from a museum that was located in a library a few miles south. But it is, if you, anywhere you go, you're gonna see something about the Coral Court and the, the legendary uh, architecture and all this strange and exciting things that happened there. Moving a bit further south, we come across a barn here. These barns were ubiquitous all up and down the route. A, a man opened a business, it was a cave tour uh, called Merrimack Caverns. Now, the problem was he didn't have a lot of money when he first got started and he needed a way to promote it. So what he did was he traveled up and down Route 66 and any farmer that had a barn that faced Route 66, he would offer $50 to if he could point, uh, paint Merrimack Caverns on there and how far it was to the business. Wasn't long before people driving either direction on Route 66 would keep seeing Merrimack Caverns over and over and over again. By the time they got to it, they had to know what was there and business was booming. Unfortunately, these barns have mostly fallen down or been painted over. There aren't more than six or seven good examples left. This one actually is a National Historic Site and they're trying to preserve it because it was so ubiquitous at one time. This is actually Merrimack Caverns. It was discovered in 1720, uh, but in 1890, they started using it for cave parties. 
until a guy by the name of Lester Dill came along and said, you know what? I could make money off of this. He bought it and started running cave tours in here. And it's been running nonstop ever since, except when it's been closed for flooding, which happens, unfortunately, quite often. Um, it's an excellent cave tour. I highly recommend it if you enjoy caves. But one of the interesting things about Merrimack Caverns is something they invented. Uh, he needed, as I said, something, some way to promote the business. And it wasn't just enough to have the barns. So in the 50s, he started doing something new. When you pulled in to take the cave tour, while you were on the tour, he would send an employee running out and they would slap a bumper sticker on your bumper that said, I visited Merrimack Caverns. Um, he thought this was a great way to promote it. Uh, and he claims he invented the bumper stickers. These are the first examples of bumper stickers. I don't know whether they were the first ones, but I do know that the practice, practice existed because in the 60s and 70s, my family visited this both times. We were slapped with a bumper sticker. The last time the manager had a conversation with my father, I don't think he will soon forget. Oops, moving back. Uh, another way that they made money at Merrimack Caverns was to open their own motel. They're having all these people come. Why not have them stay on property? So they opened a classic motel in the 50s. It's still there. You can still stay there. It's been recently refurbished. And my wife and I decided to stay. When we checked in, they asked us if we wanted a classic or a current room. I asked them the difference. They said, well, the classic rooms are a bit older. They're a little cheaper. And they have a slightly smaller bathtub. I said, okay, well, great. I want the authentic Route 66 experience. Give me a classic room. And we marched into our room and I prepared to take a nice comfortable bath in my slightly smaller bathtub. <laughs> Let's just say there was a shower in my future. This thing is itty bitty. Moving south, we come to one of the most famous lodges on Route 66 because of its unusual premise. The Bourbon Lodge was for bourbon lovers and they had cabins back in the woods. This is just the lobby. And they would come in, check in, they'd have a bottle of bourbon waiting for you in the room. And you were hidden back there in the woods and people would just sit there and enjoy these fine bourbons. Uh, and just in case, on the off chance, they might run out of bourbon. They didn't wanna lose their clientele. So they had a supply put in. Okay. Actually, Obviously, this in, is a famous inn, but it wasn't based on bourbon. The town's name is Bourbon. Uh, and about 20 years ago, they decided to put up a water tower um, and put the name on it. And this became one of the most taken photographs on Route 66. The lodge is real. People did stay there, but the bourbon premise is a little far-fetched. There are still some classic attractions on Route 66, and this is a really nice one that is very unfortunately named. Uh, it contains many relics from previous Route 66 attractions that have gone under, like this giant Tyrannosaurus Rex and this wonderful satellite light they have there. Uh, they have a lot of things to do here as well, but they named it after a planet that is loved by junior high school boys the world over. Yes, this is Uranus, Missouri. Uh, Uranus, Missouri is a, a truck stop that has a great number of things that you used to find on Route 66. Lots of ways of entertaining yourself. It also has more double entendre than you ever, ever want to experience in one place. We're not going to go into those here, but they do have a sideshow museum. They have axe throwing, an escape room, a fudge store. Please don't go give me a on that, what they do with that. And ice cream and funnel cake store as well. So it's worth your time if you can ignore the uh, childishness of it all, as it were. A little further down, as we're almost getting ready to leave Missouri and enter Kansas, we come into Fannick and Fanning, and Fanning has the world's largest rocking chair. I'm not sure why one would want such a thing, but it is a stop along the route. Actually, I say it's the world's largest rocking chair. It isn't anymore. About 15 years ago, someone 30 miles away built a slightly larger rocking chair, uh, just bumping Fanning's rocking chair out of the world's record book. Uh, I wasn't aware that there was a competitive market for rocking chairs, but apparently Missouri is the, uh, is the capital of such. And as we continue to head closer and closer to Kansas, uh, we come across another old abandoned alignment of Route 66, and this one actually has a rather sad tale. This is one of the earliest alignments of Route 66 that got paved. Later, it became an access road for a section of interstate and lost its Route 66 status. But then later, that section of interstate was realigned and both were abandoned. And it now sits out there in the middle of a field. You have to kind of know how to get to it uh, as an example of an abandoned alignment of Route 66. But this one holds a particular place, uh, a 
sorry, claim to fame uh, that many people seek out. And this place is a little hard to find. You have to know where to look. And it's a place called John's Modern Cabins. John's Modern Cabins was built in 1931 as B and Bess's place. But in 1951, it was purchased and it became John's Modern Cabins. Now the word modern occurs all up and down the route, but I never could figure out how this guy had the tenacity or yeah, had the nerve to use it because John's Modern Cabins had no electricity, no plumbing, no restrooms, no air conditioning, no telephones. I'm not sure what made these cabins modern in his mind. In fact, it did have an outhouse. For 12 cabins, it had one outhouse. Ironically, it's one of the two buildings remaining standing. It's directly behind the cabin here. Um, it is one of the more sought after photographs on the route. It is difficult to get to. You have to drive down that old abandoned access road, know where it is and hike through the woods a bit to see it. Uh, the cabins are falling apart. They're very dangerous. So you're not allowed to get too close. Uh, you do have to trespass on private property to get these pictures, but every now and then you know, gotta do what you gotta do. Directly behind this cabin is the one remaining out, the only outhouse it ever had. But John's Modern Cabins has been closed since 1965 and there's not gonna be much of it left soon. Part of the problem we've got as the route fades away is that many of these old places are being either torn down or left to rot. Every, every time we look at the route or we study the route, something is gone. In the last 15 years, many of the most famous landmarks have disappeared. So if you wanna tour the route, as soon as it becomes safe to do so again, I highly recommend that you schedule it sooner rather than later because we're losing this history. As you travel down that closed access road, it eventually goes on to another alignment of Route 66. I saw this building, I took a picture of it, not because it's a very interesting building, but because of this right here. You see this, it says 5% beer. During prohibition, the legal limit of alcohol on beer was 5%. So what you're probably looking at here is an old prohibition era store or restaurant, we don't know which. It's long since abandoned. Apparently somebody moved in briefly and put in satellite service, but it's just sitting there as a reminder of earlier days. Now the Abbey Lee Modern Motor Court is actually not all that big a deal. I've done a little research into this place. It was pretty well known on the route. It had a couple of cafes and a, a lot of very comfortable cabins. Each one had three rooms and a patio and they did indeed sit amongst the trees. But it was this among the trees thing that caught my attention. What you're looking at behind here, one of the buildings, one of the old cafes and the lobby. Those are not the actual cabins in the motor court. But if you want to get a room at Abbey Lee among the trees, there's still a few available and there are indeed among the trees. That is one of the cabins there. After seeing the sign and seeing that I had to put it up here. Now, Gay Parita is an interesting place. This is a replica, actually, of a uh, Sinclair service station that was built in 1930. It was built by uh, a man who built it for his wife. His wife's name was Gay. This was Fred Mason who built it. And we, he named it Gay Parita. We're not exactly sure where the Parita came from. It could mean angel. It could mean equal. It could mean something else. But he definitely named it after his wife, Gay. Uh, and they owned it for many, many years, but sadly, it burned to the ground in 1955. Uh, around that time, uh, well, actually a bit later, uh, it, sat around, it sat abandoned for about 15 years when a guy by the name of Gary and Lena Turner uh, found it, he and his wife. Now, Gary has a, a California connection. At one time, he made his living by playing the... Uh, uh, bank robbery in the Knott's Berry Farm wet shootout Western show. He eventually moved here to Missouri, saw what remained of Gay Parita, decided he wanted to build something there. So he rebuilt the whole thing from scratch in 2004, leaving what little was remaining, including the original pumps. But he never sold gasoline here. Uh, instead, he has a souvenir shop inside and he sold cold liquid, but you could pull into Gay Parita and he would never try to sell you a thing. His whole purpose for buying the station and rebuilding it was so that he could talk to the people who went up and down the route. And he made it his business to travel the entire route and get to know everyone along it. So he knew where the good places were and the bad places were, and he could offer advice to anyone who came in. It was said that there was no such thing as a 15 minute visit to Gay Parita. Gary would talk to you as long as, or I'm, yeah, it was Gary. I get my people crossed in this history. Gary would talk to you as long as you would let him. And he became a legend up and down the route. 
Unfortunately, he passed away in 2015, and it became a real concern what was going to happen to this place that had become so much of Route 66's history. Well, his family decided that it was so important, they couldn't just leave it to sit there and rot. So they purchased it again, and uh, Gary's daughter, Barb, and her husband, George, now run the place. And they do exactly what Gary used to do. They just sit around and they talk to people who came through. They'd love to sell you something if you ask, but they're not in it for that. They're there to shed spread stories. Again, the currency of Route 66 is stories. And when you stop at one of these places, you really want to stop and talk to the people because you'll hear so much history and so many tales of people along the route. That's what they're in it for. When we pulled in, George, uh, Gary's son-in-law was working there, sitting out front. We pulled in, he ran out to the car and immediately began giving us a tour of the entire property. He talked to us for, to, for over an hour. All I did was buy a shot glass, but he didn't care. He just wanted to talk to us, tell us about places he'd seen, give us recommendations, tell us tales, and he wanted to hear our stories. So this place is still going strong based on the history that started with it, you know, almost three decades ago now. Well worth stopping by if you're on the route. South of Gay Parita is one of the older cavern tours. It actually, in its current form, has only been running since 1962. This is Fantastic Caverns. Fantastic Caverns is a classic tourist trap. It's a cave that you drive through. What happens is you show up, they load you in a trailer behind the Jeep, and they drive through the whole thing. Uh, it was originally discovered in 1862. And it was a speakeasy during Prohibition, but in 1962, it was converted to its current form. And the drive-through thing was a gimmick. In the golden age of Route 66, there were so many tourist tracks, you had to do something that made you stand out. Uh, if you drop, travel the north-south interstate, co interstate corridor in this part of the country, you're going to see a ton of signs for Fantastic Caverns. It's actually not a bad little cave tour. As we enter Kansas, if you're willing to take a slight detour, uh, you can head to the town of Cocker. This is considered to be a Route 66 landmark, even though it's not really that close to the route, but this is the world's largest ball of twine. Uh, people on the route love big things. This actually isn't my photo. If you'll notice, the ball of twine is wearing a mask. Uh, that is because this photo was taken just last week. My sister took a mini Route 66 trip and headed past us and took a picture because we had never been there. And I told her if she'd take a picture, I would put it in the presentation. So there it is. If you need a little twine, head to Cocker, Kansas. In Kansas, by the way, Kansas is the smallest, well, not the smallest state on the route, but it has the shortest length of Route 66 of any of the states. There are only 13 miles of Route 66 in Kansas. So you're in and out very, very quickly. But along those 13 miles is a little town called Galena. And here we have the first encounter with a group of people from Pixar who were uh, researching the movie Cars. They came through the little town of Galena, stopped, and they noticed this little tow truck sitting off to the side. This was the tow truck that they confirm inspired Mater for the movie Cars. Uh, along the route, you'll encounter several other uh, Pixar encounters. In this presentation, there'll be two more, I think. As you leave Galena, you finally come to the end of Kansas. And if you know where to look deep in the woods, there is a memorial, or I'm sorry, a monument to the three corners where Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri meet. This is three quarters monument. They built it during the depression era and it, you're supposed to be able to go there and stand in the three states. There was just one small problem. During the depression era, we didn't have GPS. When we finally got GPS, we looked and said, oops, the three states actually don't meet here. They actually meet eight feet to the left. So what did they do? Well, they ripped the plaques off. You can see down here where the plaque was mounted. They ripped the plaque off and then eight feet to the left, they re-monumented. I love that term. They re-monumented it and put the plaque where the three states actually meet. So the poor other monument was left to stand there as a salute to failure. And <laughs> You can see the actual three monuments. Actually, to get on this, you have to get on private property. It is a public monument. You have a right to go there, but you're almost certain to met at, be met, as Mandy and I were, by casino security guards who own the casino property where this thing is located. We're heading into Oklahoma now. This is a Dairy King restaurant. I just, I like this picture. This woman actually has been working on the route for a long time. I don't have her name in this presentation, but she makes Route 66 cookies that she sells along the way. I spent about an hour talking to her. She's been on the route for a very long time, knows a lot of stories. 
Uh, along the route, you'll see a lot of signs for Dairy King. Now, you probably haven't heard of Dairy Queen. You've probably heard of his consort, the Dairy Queen. Uh, but Dairy King was a chain along the route that's mostly failed. This is the only functional Dairy King I know of now. We're moving into a town now called Miami. It's actually spelled Miami, but they pronounce it Miami. No one explained it why. And the claim to fame in Miami is the Coleman Theater. And what makes this theater special again is the story behind it. The, one of the founding fathers of the town really wanted Zigfield's Follies to come to the town because he knew that would bring a lot of business and a lot of attention to his town. When he talked to Mr. Zigfield, he said, well, that's fine. You have to have a first rate theater that'll seat at least a thousand people. And it has to be a beautiful theater. We don't perform in dumps. And he said, no problem. We got one of those set up right downtown. He, Zigfield said, fine, we'll be there in a year. You'll open the season there. Well, there was a small problem. You see, the man from Miami had lied. There was no theater in Miami. And so quickly they panicked and began to build the Coleman Theater. They pulled together all, all of his personal fortune and a large uh, money raising campaign in town. And one day before Zigfield Follies was to arrive, they opened on this very stage. This stage here. Uh, contains its original backdrop. You can see it back there in the back. It has never been dark for a single day since it opened. Uh, it opened with Will Rogers and the Zigfield Follies performing on here. This became a fam favorite performing spot for Will Rogers. As a matter of fact, Will Rogers was born not too far down the road. He loved this part of town. He often came to the Miami, uh, to the theater here to perform. Uh, Wiley Post, his pilot, would often come with him. Uh, if they arrived early, they could be seen sitting out front of the theater playing cards. And if you wanted to, you could deal in and they'd play poker with you. I understand it was a great way to lose your money. Uh, this theater became very popular. Later, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope and other celebrities bought into the board and they performed here quite often. So this theater has quite an illustrious history. It is absolutely dropped at gorgeous inside. And it has a mighty Wurlitzer, one of the original ones. It has been hooked up again to all the pipes that run 360 degrees around the theater. They bring in people to play it. I've heard it played. It is amazing. Uh, if you get a chance to visit the theater just to see this mighty Wurlitzer, I do recommend it. Uh, so it continues on even through the COVID epidemic. They are not dark yet. Hopefully they'll survive this and continue on. Entering a town called Afton, Oklahoma, and yet another motel ruin. As you travel Route 66 and go through all these towns and tourist traps that have died, you see a lot of motels and gas stations and cafes in ruins. And like I said, I have more pictures than you could shake a stick at. But this one I kept because it has a humorous story. This is the Avon Motel in Afton, Oklahoma. It still has three cabins left. I liked this picture, so I published it to an abandoned places, modern ruins type site. And it became very popular, actually. It went kind of viral, went from site to site to site. And apparently some algorithm on the internet noticed it. Because about three weeks later, I started getting emails from Travelocity saying things like, great rates available at the Avon Motel. Only three rooms left at the Avon Motel. Book now. This continues for several weeks until I think someone finally figured out that they were trying to book me into a, a you know, non-existent hotel. I almost went to Travelocity and posted a review of my stay there, but I decided not to. This is another abandoned motel, nothing spectacular about it. I just love it because they're so proud of the fact that they have showers. On a more serious note, as you travel a bit further down, you come to the town of Claremore, Oklahoma. Now, Will Rogers was born just north of here in Ulagao, or North uh, Oklahoma. And he loved this stretch of the route. He loved this part of Oklahoma. And so when he died, they buried him here. Uh, this is the Will Rogers Museum. His burial site is right there. The museum, if you're interested in anything about Will Rogers, is a must do. They play Will Rogers movies 24 seven. They have fantastic displays on the history of his life. They have several of the rooms from his house in California that were moved intact here. Uh, and you get to know a lot about a man who was one of the greatest entertainers of his time. And this, uh, this gravesite is actually very, very touching to visit. Gonna go back and visit something that I mentioned earlier. Route 66 can't emphasize enough during the golden age how 
big a deal Route 66 was. The traffic was insane, so much so that people could not cross the street. And often they didn't even obey traffic lights. So towns that had this route go right through the center of town suddenly found themselves divided in half because they couldn't cross the road. That's how heavy traffic got on Route 66 during its golden age. Well, they had to solve the problem. The kids had to walk to school. The families had to walk to church. So they built Many of these towns built these pedestrian underpasses. We know of five or six examples. Most of them are closed off and locked away. But this town decided, hey, we got this. Why not celebrate it? So inside the underpass, they painted a mural that gives you the complete history of Route 66. And on the other side, you can sign a wall to leave a little memento of your visit to their underpass. We're going to see another underpass before we finish, by the way. A little bit further down as we head across Oklahoma, we come to a town called Foyle. And Foyle is famous for a man named Ed Galloway, at least famous among Route 66 people. Sometime in 1937, Ed decided he needed something to do. This was his actual explanation. He wanted to build some place that would be a good place for Boy Scouts and kids to visit. That's what he said. So he started building these concrete totem poles. The very first one is the one you see here. It was started in 1937, but he was interrupted by the war. He didn't finish it till 1948. It actually has several rooms inside and a spiral staircase. It is the fourth tallest totem pole in the world and the tallest concrete totem pole in the world. Um, when he finished that, he began to build several other totem poles until there's this entire park of concrete totem poles that has left us. He passed away in 1962, but the park is still maintained. It's a very popular stop on the route. Now, his wife got a little tired of his obsession one day, and she decided to taunt him. She sent him a parody of Joyce Kilmer's poem called Trees. Uh, the poem that she sent him said, Totem poles are made by fools like thee, but only God can make a tree. Well, Ed took umbrage of the fact that he wasn't necessarily able to make a tree, so he decided to prove his wife wrong. In response to that poem, he built this tree. Uh, and you can see here he even put in little holes where birds can nest in the tree. So he was something of a fanatic, but he left behind a great gift. This park is larger, I think 15, 20 totem poles. It's a lot of fun to stop on on the way. Again, Route 66 is about large things. And if you're gonna have large things, you might as well have a whale. This may be the most popular tourist or well-known tourist trap along the route. This is a Catoosa blue whale located in the town of Catoosa. If you watch the show American Pickers, they did an episode here. And it's not as old as people think. It was actually built in the early 70s by a man by the name of Hugh Davis. He built it as a surprise anniversary for his, a gift for his wife, Zelta. Now, if you're thinking his wife was going, gee, dear, thank you for the giant concrete whale. Happy anniversary, I guess. Actually, he knew she collected whale figurines and figured she would love it. So he built a whole swimming hole around the whale. Uh, you can climb up on top of it, dive off. You can slide uh, it wasn't built for public use. It was built for his family, but it's visible from the route and people kept seeing it and the townspeople could see it and people kept showing up and wanting to use it. So much so the crowd became so big that he eventually was almost forced to build a park. And that's exactly what he did. He built a park and that park featured really strange little tables. If you look at these sort of snaily pelican fish things, I've never really been able to identify them. Uh, these things here is what I'm talking about. Uh, picnic tables, we could have picnics. He had a snack bar. Uh, he featured uh, a man by the name of Wolf, Ro Wolf Robe Hunt, a Native American who would perform Native American dances, tell stories. He had a trading post across the way. Uh, he also had a Noah's Ark there, which has not yet been restored. And uh, he also, we'll see it here, a, a snake pit. I'm going to go back, but he also had a snake pit. Most of this was abandoned when his wife died and then he passed away. And for years, it just sat empty. But in 1997, the people of Catoosa decided it was just too valuable. So them, along with the Hampton Inn employees in the area, took about 10 years and restored the whole thing. And now you can, you can visit the Catoosa Whale and the uh, picnic area. They haven't been able to restore Noah's Ark yet. This, uh, yeah, that's Noah's Ark. They haven't been able to get to any of the other parts of the park. This was a reptile area. And then right back in the back, they had this water fountain garden with these strange mushroom water fountains. I'm not really sure what's going on here. I figured maybe you saw Fantasia one too many times. 
We are now moving into T uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is one of my wife's favorite towns on the route because it is the Art Deco capital of the route. If you love Art Deco, you need to go to Tulsa and just drive around downtown. There are just tons of examples of Art Deco. The thing I chose to feature from Art Deco, though, is completely different. It's a more modern restaurant named Tally's. Uh, and the reason, again, that I love Tally's, like most things, is because it has a story. Tally Alame is a man who moved here in 1979. He is a Lebanese man who was sent to the United States by his family to escape the violence in Lebanon during its civil war. Here he worked his way through college in a restaurant until he got his degree and he found an empty restaurant in Tulsa, decided to buy it. And as a way to honor this country that had welcomed him and offered him so much success, he themed it to the USA in 1950s in, on Route 66. So he's preserving a slice of our heritage as a way to thank the country for everything our country's given him. This place is wonderful. It's all, it's very well themed but the food here is absolutely amazing. It's been voted the best diner in Tulsa multiple times. He's actually opened a second location, it's so popular. He serves free, free Thanksgiving dinners every year to the homeless in the area. But the thing I love Tally's for is this. Tally's is the winner of the best apple pie award route of Don and Mandy's Route 66 Adventure Award. This is a hard award to win folks. I ate apple pie in so many places, but nothing came even close to Tally's. They're famous for their cinnamon rolls, but I tell you, buy the pie. As we head on out from Tulsa and we're heading towards Oklahoma City, we come to the little town of Stroud. Unfortunately, one of the more famous spots on the route is, is Rock Cafe, and I couldn't go inside. But the reason this is famous is one, it's been there since night, well, it's been owned and operated by one woman since 1993. It's been here most of, of last century. But Don Welch is famous because when the Pixar team came down through here, they stopped to eat. They met Don Welch, who was working at the grill, and she became the inspir inspiration for the character Sally Carrar in Cars. Yet another story, yet another ruin. This is just an old gas station, lots of them along the route. But I love this gas station. It was built in the early 1920s by a couple of brothers, and they did all right with it. They didn't make a lot of money, but they made some money. And they were constantly, constantly looking for a way to make money. Well, in the late 20s, they were visited by a couple of men from Chicago who had, shall we say, strong family connections. And these men told them how they could make a lot more money. They could make a lot more money. Literally, they could make money. They built a building behind the gas station as the, the, these men's recommendation. It was hidden amongst the trees. The woods are very thick there. It could only be entered through this window that you see over here to the right. And the shutters were always closed on the window. So no one knew the building was back there. And in that building, they put up a printing press and they began to quite literally make money. They had a counterfeiting business that boomed out of this little gas, in, gas station for almost a decade. The problem is they were too successful and they flooded the route with counterfeit money, catching the attention of the feds who traced it back to its source, arrested them, threw them into jail, took the station away. It never operated again afterwards and fell into ruin. And it sits there today as a reminder that for those who travel down Route 66, you should be sure to stay on the straight and narrow. Now, I don't have any pictures of the next building. I wish I did, but all the ones I have have horrible sun, sun glare on them. But there's a place in Arcadia called the Round Barn. And if you look in any single guidebook anywhere, they say you must visit the Round Barn. And I couldn't figure out why. I've seen Round Barns. They're not that common, but I've seen Round Barns. This one had a museum inside, but let's face it, Route 66 is covered with museums. But everybody raved about it. So we went in there. And as I went in there, I saw this old man wandering around. He'd go up to people and then he'd talk to them briefly and they would walk away from him kind of hurriedly. And I went, oh great, it's one, you know, this guy's a, a pain. And he walked up to me and he said, so do you want to hear a story or do you want to be left alone? Now I've learned in the time I've been studying Route 66 when the, if someone asks you if you want to hear a story, you say yes. So I said, I want to hear a story. And that is how I met Mr. Sam. For the next hour, Mr. Sam told me stories of the area, how his grandfather founded their farm in the great Oklahoma land rush. He staked out, a land, staked out the land and his family has been living there ever since. 
He, he told us about the history of the town, the history of Route 66. He told us about his three lovely ladies. He's been married three times, outlived two wives, and is working on a third. Mr. Sam was 93 years old when I met him in 1996, which means he's probably 98 now, if my math is good. Uh, he used to be out there every day. Now he's only there usually only one day a week. We were very lucky to encounter him. If you happen to be in Arcadia, step in, and if you see Mr. Sam, Tell him you want to hear a story. I promise you, it's worth your while. And I mentioned the Oklahoma land run. It actually took place here in Arcadia. What would happen is the people would all come out to this site that you see here. Uh, they would line up along a line. Someone would fire a gun and they'd take off. And if you could get to a stretch of land no one had claimed and drive a stake into it, that land was yours. That was how Mr. Sam's farm was established. They div divvied up the land and that's how all the little towns in the area became founded. Not a lot of mention about who had the land before them, unfortunately. Route 66 has something of a tragic history with the Native, pop, Native American population. It follows the Trail of Tears for a great deal of its length. I'm not gonna get into that in this presentation just because there's so much there. But as you travel Route 66, you discover a great deal of what happened to the Native American population as this country expanded. At the edge of Arcadia is something very cool. This is Pops. Pops is a store that sells over 700 kinds of soda and they set themselves up specifically to become another Route 66 tourist trap. To do that, they built this giant neon bottle that stands 200 feet tall and at night, it lights up in all sorts of different colors. Uh, they have a gas station and a cafe, but they're most famous for selling 700 different types of soda and 700 flavors. If you can't find a soda you like here, um, you know, you're not gonna drink, a, you just can't drink soda then. Um, this has become a very popular place along the route. I mentioned earlier on that Will Rogers and Wiley Post had a history. Well, if you come into Oklahoma City, uh, you'll find the grave of Wiley Post. Uh, I mentioned it here because Wiley Post is not known by many people and he was a remarkable man. Uh, he was not just Will Rogers' pilot and the pilot flying when, they passed, when he passed away, but Wiley Post held a distinguished fly, flying cross for his service during the war. He's in the National Aviation Hall of Fame. He was once a parachutist for flying circuits, and he developed the world's first pressure suit. And he is the man that discovered the jet stream while flying over Chicago. So Wiley Post was a scientist and an acclaimed pilot, very skilled. Most people have never heard of him. Now, he has one other part of his story that gives him something in common with a neighbor of his that we'll see in a moment. Wiley Post, before he became a pilot, was desperate for money and started living as a an armed robber and was arrested for armed robbery and thrown in jail. And it was when he came out of that uh, that he began trying to seek other pursuits. But he started off rather shady, which gives him a nice tie to someone who's located about 500 feet down the road in the cemetery. And this is Elmer McCurdy. Elmer McCurdy is famous because he was the last known train robber in Oklahoma and he was shot dead while trying to rob a train in 1911. Now, it would have been an interesting story just leaving it there, but because there was a long trial regarding the train robbery and the other people who did survive the attempt, they actually preserved the body and ended up embalming it. And sometime after the trial, Elmer disappeared. Okay. Uh, we got home. Okay. Not trial, but yeah. 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 So Elmer disappeared and no one knew what happened to him. Uh, flash forward about 56 years, 66 years. And in 1976 in LA, they were shooting an episode of the $6 million man. And the episode took place in a carnival. They went into a fun house. And while they were filming, somebody said, you know, that dummy looks a little too real. So they pulled it out and they checked it and surprise, it was Elmer. Uh, apparently what had happened is someone had stolen the body, sold it to a traveling carnival, which sold it to a freak show, which sold it to a circus, which sold it to, and Elmer toured the country for the next 65 years. And eventually ended up in LA where the $6 million man found him. So Elmer has three claims to fame. He was the last bank robber. He's the only man who was ever shot dead and toured the country for 60 years afterwards. And he is the only bank robber who was ever shot dead, toured the country to have been a TV star in an episode of the $6 million man. They returned him here, put him in the original gravesite where he was intended to be buried. That gravesite just under the dirt is covered with a slab of concrete so that Elmer cannot travel anymore. I mentioned the Rock Island Line earlier. As we come into the town of El Reno, Oklahoma, you're gonna find an old Rock Island Line station. 
Now the Rock Island line followed the Route 66 for most of its Western half. And I love old train stations, but usually when you go in, most of the original things have been ripped out. I love this one because even though the Rock Island line has been gone for 40 years, this place is intact. The benches where you waited are still there. The ticket offices are still there. Everything is still there. And it's run by people. You can see one guy in the back who worked the train station. This museum is run by those people who worked it, knew it, and can tell you all about the history of the area, of the train station, and of the Rock Island line itself. It's a great way to learn about the railroad history in this part of the world. A little further down, another tragic tale about realignment. Routes used to get realigned for several reasons. One, a town would outbid you. The most common cause was the interstate would come along, but also not uncommon is a bridge would go out along the route. When a bridge failed on the route, it was often easier to realign it and less expensive than to rebuild the bridge because they would find a better place to cross. Such is this sad tale of Bridgeport, ironically, Oklahoma. The route comes in one side and it crossed a river on the other side, but the bridge went out and they realigned it because it was cheaper. And the little town of Bridgeport no longer had a bridge. Mandy and I found the abandoned alignment, drove into Bridgeport. It was once a really large town, very, very important town in the area. This is the only building that remains. There's literally nothing else now. All that remains is their abandoned post office. And you can wander in there. The post office boxes with names are still there. But there's nothing else left. If there is a patron saint of Route 66, her name is Lucille Hammond. If you read anything on Route 66, I promise you it will not be long before you come across Lucille Hammond's name. Uh, this is Lucille's service station. And it's, it's a classic service station built in 1929, but as is many things about Route 66, it's not the building that's important, it's the people behind it. This was built by Lucille Hammond. Uh, I'm sorry, this was uh, built in 1929, but it was purchased by Lucille Hammond in 1941. Uh, and her and her husband, Carl, ran it until 1970s. When Carl left the day they closed the interstate and business stopped going by but Lucille refused to give up. She stopped selling fuel in 1986, but she still refused to give up. She started selling what she said was the coldest beer in Oklahoma. And she remained working here until uh, August of 2000, when she passed away still working at the station. If you look above the gas pumps here, you're gonna see a small apartment. This is where Lucille and Carl lived. This is where Lucille had her child. This is where they raised their family in this one room. And this is where Lucille died. Okay, all of that is impressive enough, but the real story behind Lucille is what she did. Lucille is known, and this is the name she gave herself. She was a great pro promoter, but Lucille is known as the mother of the mother road. You see, it became well known up and down the road that if you needed a place to stay and didn't have any money, Lucille would let you stay in her motel. If you needed something to eat, Lucille would find something for you to eat. If your car was broken down and it couldn't go any further, she would buy your car from you. And if she had another one, she'd sell it to you for a dollar. She did that by parting out the car you sold her to make the money back. Um, and Lucille just loved to talk to people. She cared for people. And one of the last interviews I've read with her, she said, I never tried to make money. I don't understand how I made money. You just had to do what was right by people. She said, you didn't worry about the money. You worried about serving the people who came through your station. She said, I don't regret a day of it. I never got rich. I barely hung on, but I'm happy with the place I lived. Lucille's name spread up and down the route and just became legendary as the mother of the mother road. So much so that she buried nearby in the little town of Hydro. And this is her tombstone. Route 66, Lucille Hammonds, the mother of the mother road. She is a legendary figure and anybody who studies Route 66 has to stop by Lucille to pay, Hammond, uh, to pay homage to the mother of the mother road. Nearby Hydro is the town of Clinton, Oklahoma. It contains yet another Route 66 museum. It's actually a pretty good one. It's where I got the shirt I'm wearing. Uh, but I didn't take many photos inside. Instead, this diner caught my attention. This is a diner that you'll see up and down the route. That's very, very small. It's about the size of a storage container that you'd ship on a freight ship. Uh, and it's actually part of history because it was part of something called the Valentine Lunch System. Back in the 1930s, a man by the name of Arthur Valentine created uh, a system where he could build a little tiny diner, put it on a flatbed truck, send it to you for $5,000 or just $400 a month. 
And he would put it down in your town. You hook up water, hook up electricity, and you were ready to go. A Valentine diner typically only seated six people, but they were perfect for the little itty-bitty towns of two or 300 people that couldn't support a full-size diner. And they allowed people to draw in business from Route 66. And you will find these all up and down the route. Unfortunately, they're not really well made. Now, some have been refurbished. Actually, one of them now serves as a substation for the Albuquerque police. I couldn't find it when we were there, but I want to find it. But many of them, well, they're not doing so well. They're typically just, you know, mobile homes. And we'll see them in a moment. The inside is very small. If you look back here, there's the grill. There's your beverage section. You've got three seats here. There's one in the corner you can't see and two at my feet. Six people at one time. But like I said, for a little town that couldn't afford a full-fledged restaurant, these were godsends. And there are little Valentine diners all along the route. The company ran successfully for over 40 years before going out of business. But the buildings eventually gave way. And what you find is just remains of the Valentine diners. Um, and you can see, you know, this guy was partially refurbishing his when he gave up. Kind of sad to see them, but they're once a big thing along the route. If I were to recommend any museum along the route, it would be this one, the National Route 66 Museum. Uh, the reason being is one, they're one of the largest museums. They have a really neat tour inside, but the grounds, they've moved buildings from all along the route that were doomed. Famous sites that were going to be torn down. If the, if the National Museum hears about it, they purchase the building, they bring it here and they set it on their grounds. So you can tour a lot of Route 66 without ever leaving their grounds. Inside the museum there, you walk down a, an artificial Route 66, and it takes you through the entire history from the beginning days through the, uh, through the golden years, through the collapse, through the resurgence that's happening now. You notice over to the side here, the Merrimack Caverns Barn. Uh, I just show this to tell you that, you know, there were lots of towns that had the problem of Route 66 and being able to cross. This little town here is called Sayre. It had so much traffic, people couldn't cross. Uh, again, their bridge washed out. Route 66 was realigned. I never saw another car in the entire time I took this. Apparently somebody got here because they went to church. But this had four lanes of Route 66 and now it's zero. And it was so busy they needed this underpass. Now they use it as a tornado shelter. This one was built by the work uh, by the WPA in 1939. This is a cool story. This looks like the most boring building in the world. This building is located in Eric, Oklahoma. And it's called Bone Break Hardware. Uh, it's called Bone Break because the family that owned it was Bone Break. And again, from the outside, it doesn't look like much, but if you know its story, this is a cool place. You see, a family named Bone Break owned this for much of the 20th century, but for some reason that no one ever knew. Sometime in the mid 60s, they walked out the door, locked the door, left and never returned. No one knows where they went, no one knows why. But they walked away from the store, the store was never repurchased and no one ever re-entered. The town doesn't allow people to go in now. They do go in and do safety inspections from time to time. But when they left, they left everything exactly the way it was when they left in the mid 60s and they do allow people to peer in the windows. This is Bone Break Hardware and what you're looking at is a time capsule back in the mid 60s when they sold you know, sort of tourist momentums and hardware. I don't know who was going to buy the giant metal stove here, but it's just gorgeous. I also love these hats that are hanging on the cattle horns here. And if you look to the left, these cases are filled with really nice camera equipment uh, that was state of the art during the 60s. No one has ever broken in, no one goes in. So this is exactly the way they left the store. And it's kind of a cool place to look in, but you have to know what's there. You have to know what to look for. As you leave town, you might be tired from visiting Lucille's and sparing in the windows at Bone Break. Well, that's okay. There's a little rest, uh, motel out of town. Nice place. It's only been abandoned for maybe two or three decades. and But it's okay because I believe they do have a vacancy and you can get in there. We're coming into Texas now. And this is another association with, with, with Cars, the movie. Uh, this is Shamrock, Texas. And this is the Dew Drop In restaurant. Uh, and Co Conoco gas station. And this movie appear this appears in Cars. If you go to Cars Land, you'll see this building there. And it's spectacular during the day for its Art Deco style, but it's even more spectacular at night. They've restored all the neon there. So if you go there, uh, try to remember to come in at night too. And I got the name of the place wrong. I always do. It's actually called the U Drop-In, not the Dew Drop-In. My wife is nodding at me. She didn't quite slap me. Um, 
the U Drop In was a cafe, and they have other services for travelers. It was quite popular in its day. The place offered auto laundry lubrication. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> what that is. I don't think I want to find out. But this is the inside of the U Drop In. Uh, if you look in the back here, you're going to see a booth with a picture on it. That is the booth where Elvis apparently ate lunch as he was traveling down Route 66. But this had been immortalized in cars and in cars land out in California. You know a town is boring when your biggest claim to fame is barbed wire, but they built a museum in McLean, which is just north of Shamrock. Uh, was a big town, had four lanes of highway. Now there's nothing there, but they do have their tribute to barbed wire and yet another Route 66 museum. It's actually not bad. Um, what I found fascinating was not only did they have the two museums, but they are located in a former brazier factory. Ah, another fun place. I love old ruins. If you haven't figured it out, this is a ruin of a place called the Magnolia Cafe. Uh, but the Magnolia Ca Cafe sits in a town called Allen Reed, and it's a town I love almost more than the cafe. Uh, it was originally called Prairie Dog Village, and it was a very popular spot, a very large spot. Uh, what you're looking at was located downtown. Across the street was this Sinclair station that was very popular as well. They had a hotel and a saloon and a large general store. There was a population of six or 700, which in those days in this part of Texas was big. And they were actually vying to be the county seat until one day in Prairie Dog Village, a fight broke out in the saloon and one man gouged the eye out of someone else. And for some reason, they thought this was an important event and they renamed the town after it. For a long time, Prairie Dog Village was known as Gouge Eye, Texas. Um, apparently someone later decided that, that wasn't a very tasteful name and they named it to Alan Reed. But the reason that this town was so popular and the reason it died wasn't what happened there, it was where it was located. You see, this was the last stop on the route before one of its most treacherous locations. And people would often stop and stay here overnight before they dared to traverse this next place. Not the cemetery, but a town called Jericho and not the town specifically, but this stretch of road. This is the infamous Jericho Gap. If you watch the Grapes of Wrath, uh, you will see the Jericho Gap. It was a fine road three quarters of the year, but when it rained, the Jericho Gap turned into a mud pit that you have never seen before, such that most cars couldn't get through. Farmers would come up with their horses and pull, for a price, pull your cars through the mud. Sometimes some enterprising farmers were actually seen watering the road too. You don't see it much here as how treacherous it actually was. Uh, for many, many years, they advised that if it was raining, you stay away from the gap. As a matter of fact, if you read guidebooks today, they tell you to stay off the alignment. The interstate is about a mile to the north. And uh, they still tell you to stay off if it's raining. But it's not so bad they put caliche on it. A little later on, you're going to see what it can become when it rains. We're almost to the end of our road here. We're coming up into our Amarillo and Amarillo is best known for two things. The first is the Big Texan Steakhouse. At the Big Texan Steakhouse, you can get a 72 ounce steak, a salad, a baked potato, a roll, and a shrimp cocktail. And it's all free, provided you can eat all of it in under an hour. And it's a very popular, I, I can't imagine anyone even trying, but it is very popular. Mandy and I went there twice. We didn't try it, but each time we saw lots of people trying it. If you look in the back here, there are the timers. They're sitting up on a raised stage. Each time we went, at least one person succeeded, eating all of that in under an hour. But the record down here, first place, someone ate it all in under five minutes, four minutes and 18 seconds. And this is the lady who did it right here. She holds the record. The next one is seven, the closest is seven minutes, and there's even someone else who ate it in eight. So three people have eaten it under 10 minutes. Uh, I've seen that meal, not a chance. Uh, but, you know, if you want a free meal and you're willing to suffer. The other thing it's known for, the town is known for, it's the Cadillac Ranch. This is a rather famous art installation. Someone came along and planted a bunch of Cadillacs nose down in the dirt. And he allows people, anyone who wants to, to come out and paint them, put their names on them, put graffiti on them. There is a mark on there for Mandy and I, but I'm sure it's been covered over many times over. Uh, but I wanted to show you not only the ranch, but look at the dirt. This is what the Jericho Gap became when it rained. This is actually only about 10 to 15 miles away from Jericho Gap. And believe it or not, this is better than what the gap was. 
So this is why they tell you to stay off the dirt roads around Jericho, Texas when it rains. It becomes a thick soup. Uh, this is located 500 miles from Route 66, or 500 miles, 500 feet from Route 66. I wanted a good shot at it, so I actually walked out there, and there were people on the road betting as to whether or not I would fall on my face. I didn't, but I actually became a, a local source of money in the economy here. <laughs> Heading into Vega, Texas. Uh, Vega has this old restored gas station. There are lots of them. They're neat, but you learn on Route 66 to look where people don't expect you to look, and behind it, I found this. Um, Route 66, again, has quite an association with some of the Native American history, and some of the roads follow Native American paths, such as this. There was a trail called the Queen of uh, Quanah Parker Trail, and this site here was a regular campsite used by the Comanche. And so back behind the gas station, where most people don't even know it's there, they put this memorial to show this is where the Comanche would, would camp out along the route. But Vega is best known for one of the cheesiest sites on the route. I love this place. This is Dot's Mini Museum. Uh, a woman named Dot Levitt started this museum in 1962. She owned a self-storage business in town. And when people would leave without paying, she took their stuff, found anything interesting, and stuck it in these two buildings back there. She continued to do that for many, many years and eventually just decided, hey, this is cool. I'll make it a museum. Uh, after she died, her family kept it open. The doors were always unlocked, so you can just walk right in. And it's called Dot's Mini Museum. Inside, you will find stuff. But it's stuff from across the last 60 years of Route 66. There's a lot of interesting things in here. Uh, not all of it is interesting, but there's something for just about everybody in Dot's Mini Museum. I just love the fact that this woman did this. And that's Dot. There you see her standing in the back. Uh, the family is maintaining it in her memory. And it's a fun place to stop. It's a true Route 66, Route 66 landmark. Now, as we leave Vega, the Route 66 alignment switched back to where the interstate is. Uh, but I've kept this slide for those of you who want to travel Route 66. I want to point out this culvert over here. Okay, and I want to point out these telephone poles. And you can't see it, but just beyond them along this ridge, it's the railroad tracks. If you're riding in the south southwestern USA along where Route 66 used to be, look for railroad tracks, telephone poles, or these culverts, and you'll probably be looking at an old alignment of Route 66 as it was, it's right here. You can sort of see it if you pull it up on Google Earth, it's mostly faded away. But the old route ran parallel to the interstate here for a while before pulling north for a bit. And that's what you look for, telephone poles, railroad tracks, or old bridges. We're almost to our goal, folks. We actually have hit the official midpoint of Route 66. That is this line, and this is at the Midpoint Cafe on either side of the line. It's 1,139 miles to the other end of the route. There's a cafe here called the Midpoint Cafe. They serve pretty good food. One of their main claims to fame though is when the Pixar team came down through here, they ate here, enjoyed the hospitality so much that they wrote a thank you note and signed a, signed a letter. And they've got that hanging there in the cafe that you can see. Just after Midpoint, you can get back on an old abandoned alignment again. I love the old abandoned alignments. We try to stay away from the interstate. Um, and if you look off to the side here, you're going to see what remains of the Rock Island Line. The Rock Island Line has been closed for over 40 years, but in certain areas, it paralleled Route 66. And this is the old bridge in there, and the track would happen on top of this, these mounts. Uh, it follows Route 66 for about 50 miles here. And all through the desert, you're going to see old abandoned railroad track alignments as well as road alignments. Look at the dirt down at the bottom. Again, when it rains, you do not want to be on this road. What you're looking at is the last motel in Texas and the first motel in Texas. Depends on which side you approach it from. From the Texas side, it was the last motel in Texas, and it said so right here. From the, from the New Mexico side, it was the first motel in Texas, and it said so right here on the other side. Unfortunately, the sign's been lost. When the route was realigned, the hotel died a horrible death. It was actually known as a very modern motel. When motels were first introduced, they were considered the thing of the future. They were considered modern. That's why you see modern on all the signs. And this place was almost always booked up. And then one day the interstate came through when they opened it like a light switch, they got no more bookings, literally zero. And within a year they were gone. A motel from an earlier time. This is a depression era motel, again, very modern. In fact, they're very proud of their modern restrooms. Uh, the motel, I'll go back to the previous slide. You can see the motel back here in the corner. The lobby is here. Uh, 
This was built in the late 20s. No one's real sure. I can't get a lot of information on this place, but it built late 20s, early 30s. And it was modern because they had two restrooms in this little building that had plumbing. The rest of the place didn't. But if you wanted modern restrooms, you could walk out here and share them with everyone else. But it's still proud of its modern restrooms even to this day. As you leave and come into New Mexico, we're approaching Albuquerque and we go through a couple of old ghost towns again to tell you what will happen when the route just suddenly dries up. This is the ruins of an old abandoned cafe sitting out there. The sign for the cafe lying right there at its feet. And another old abandoned hotel. Uh, I cannot tell you how many of these things litter the route, especially as we proceed further south. From here, you will enter Albuquerque and encounter such one. I'm sorry. Tucumcari. My wife reminds me, I'm constantly swapping names. From here, you enter Tucumcari in the world famous Blue Swallow Motel. And off from there into the desert as the route moves from forests and grasslands into the desert lands that are well known for. And we see the old Indian trading posts and a large number of old abandoned routes and tourist traps, many more than you see in the north. But for today, I think it's time to pull over, grab a slice of fried chicken, get some homemade pie, and see if you have any questions. Anybody out there? Yeah, thanks, Don. Uh, why don't you uh, stop sharing the screen so we, people get more of a, a, a giant view of all the uh, participants. Okay, uh, one second, I'll do that. Oh, it's over here, stop share. I'll start with a question for you. You mentioned uh, Beal at the very beginning. Is that the same Beal? Do you know that uh, did Beal's cut out here in California? Beal? Beal. Beal. B-E-A-L. Uh, he was the guy you mentioned with the uh, camels. Oh, no, I don't think so. He was a, he was a soldier really yeah. early on. Well, that's what oh. this guy was. Uh, they had a road uh, goes between my valley and the next valley, and they couldn't get uh any wagons over it so beal from the army was sent out here and he did a cut between the uh the two valleys uh, using chinese labor very narrow and you could get one wagon through it and it was a revolutionary thing and it's it's about maybe five miles from my house and it's a famous scene scene in a movie i think it's a tom mix movie where his horse jumps across it but it was just interesting because uh, beal was a big uh army guy out here too if folks have uh, questions, you can raise your hand uh, and we'll unmute you. Uh, okay, Irv, I see you're up there. So uh, you have to click your uh, unmute button there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, first of all, Don, that was an excellent presentation. I really enjoyed that. Thank but you, I'm, sorry it ran a bit long. <laughs> no, no, I don't mind, but I'm, I'm curious why that road died. On the East Coast, you got US Highway 1, which was another federal highway and that runs from Maine to Key West. Mm -hmm. And when they it's built 95 down the East Coast, they didn't abandon Route 1. In fact, Route 1's as crowded and busy as ever. Why did there be Route 1 and 66? Well, there are a lot of reasons, actually. Uh, one was the main purpose of the road was get across the country quickly. When the interstate came along and clobbered, a lot of people just became focused on getting where they were going. They weren't interested in stopping in these little towns, okay? Uh, the road is actually still there. Uh, the problem, and in many cases, I'd say 85% of it, you can still get to by car. Uh, but most people now, when they're traveling east-west, just want to get where they're going. And they consider the convenience of traveling to be more important. Uh, highway 1, which is also the Pacific Coast Highway, if I remember, has that wonderful ocean view that you can't get anywhere else. A lot of people didn't understand what they were missing by going back to the highway system. They didn't realize they were giving so up something as valuable as that ocean view until it was too late. And by the time people started finding out that this was a wonderful place to see, it was too late to save most of the businesses along it. Yeah, but it looks like they went out of their way to remove the Route 66 designation and even remove sections that are rude. I'm wondering why they did that. Well, they removed sections of the route that they considered unsafe. And yes, they did in 1985, remove all the Route 66 designations. If you can find one of those signs, it's worth a lot of money now. Uh, and no one really knows why. Uh, well, one of, the, one of the reasons is that the state or the federal government maintains as a route, they're oh, okay. for maintaining the property. If you mm -hmm. now decommission the road, whatever small town it's going through can decide if they want to keep the road or not. But by, by, by keeping it as a U.S. route, the U.S. government has to maintain all the bridges, the right of way and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. So that was a big, big part of it. They wanted to get out of the, uh, the maintenance cost. 
out of the root business. Uh, yeah. I can tell you, can tell you in California, you have a 50 mile stretch of Route 66 uh, located. Uh, oh gosh, there's a famous ghost town up in there, uh, but it's it's about 40 miles south of the interstate. The entire stretch is closed because five bridges have washed out, and the governor doesn't want to spend the money to rebuild them. Uh, so all the businesses along there were wiped out. Uh, Ray's Cafe uh, is just beyond that on the route. You can still oh, get to Roy's Cafe. is just beyond there on the route. Uh, but yeah, I, Bill, you're right. Actually, I had read that. They, they, there were financial reasons. A lot of it is just when people are traveling the route, they aren't interested in going the slow, easy way. Uh, Mandy and I get annoyed traveling the interstate now after doing this because you lose so much character. Anybody else? I'm going to look at the comments. Okay. Glenn has his hand up, so Glenn. Yeah, I was just going to say it was fantastic. I really uh, enjoyed that. Well, thank you. A trip in my future. <laughs> but where is going to be part two? Are you going to do the rest of the trip all the way over to Santa Monica? Well, yeah. if you're, if uh, Bill is willing to host me and you folks are interested, I'd be happy to. I actually did the whole route, but you'd die of old age if I tried to do it all in one show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're planning to do the uh, second route. I'm still trying to confirm something for next week uh, mm -hmm. for another uh, author on a 1939 uh, book that she did. So uh, I should know within the next day, two days, uh, uh, a couple. I've been reaching out to other authors, other people about uh, doing things. So I'll work that out and then we'll work it out with Don to uh, go the rest of the route. Because again, I've never been the section of the route that he just did now, I basically picked up where he ended off. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing part two because uh, when you're driving, you don't get to see as much. And my family won't let us stop or do 100 miles in a day. So I had to drive much faster and see much less of it. So I'm really looking forward to part two uh, for the stuff that I saw at 60 miles an hour. Part two is part two has more of the cheesy stuff too. A lot of the old, uh, old. Uh, trading posts and large figures, uh, a lot more humorous things out in the desert that have been abandoned. Some sad stuff too. Oh, big dinosaurs. <laughs> I feel like I just had six slices of pie. So <laughs> we can let that digest for a few weeks and get back into it. I, but congratulations, it was a great show. I well, asked thank you very a much. question when uh, we were going through this yesterday. How does he decide on something like the best root beer float? Okay. Because what if you stop in one town and you have a really good root beer float and you give them the award and then five miles down the road, you stop in another town, their root beer float was even better. And the next day there's another one. So he said he does the route several times. So that, mm -hmm. that added, answered my question on route. Um, yeah, actually, actually the awards, we are actually planning on making up plaques and sending them out, but we did do the entire route and kept records. <laughs> and uh, some of them, I mean, I, I cannot rave enough about Tavi's apple pie. That's Tolly's apple, Tolly's apple pie. Uh, that was the original start. I was going to find the best apple pie on the route, and it just sort of grew from there. Um, I'm going to try to post, by the way, while you folks are talking, I'm going to try again to post the, uh, the book references if you want to learn some of this history. Uh, if you do decide to go down the route, I highly recommend that you take a little time to read about it because so many places you you could drive right by without knowing what you're missing they're not always obvious so, any other questions I, I like the i like the comments you made about the big texan steakhouse and i'm a real i've been in that place and i saw what that steak looks like it completely covers your platter and it's like four inches thick it takes some 45 minutes to cook it properly so it's not raw on the inside but how can you eat that thing in four minutes i don't know there's some youtube videos of people that did it in an hour and it's something to watch Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, yeah, my, I, brother, my brother Jerry tried one of those. And the part that Don left out is that if you don't finish it in an hour, it's fairly okay. it, It's still yeah. not a bad price. I think it's only like $29 or $39 for all that food. So it's not a bad price for what you're getting. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a good price and uh, many people succeed, but you'll never see me trying it. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's not worth the way you're going to feel afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the truth. I'm, I'm putting the last book up now. Uh, it, it, the food there's actually, oh, I do need to warn you about something. Oh, my goodness, I'd forgotten about this. I wanted a margarita so bad. <laughs> and so I, we stopped on the way back, and I got a Texas margarita from the steakhouse. 
And I took one sip of that and I can't do spicy anything, right? And suddenly my lips began to swell up. Uh, I was in screaming pain. I flagged the waitress down and said, what in the world is going on? She said, well, it's a Texas margarita. There are jalapenos in it. <laughs> and so it's like, milk, bring me milk. <laughs> I drank several glasses of milk. They felt horrible. They never, they gave me another margarita that wasn't painful uh, and never charged me for either. But so be careful, however, if you order uh <laughs> at the Texas second order your margarita. It, you have to be a hearty soul to drink it. <laughs> uh, I just did post, by the way, in two different posts, the uh, introductory reading list that we use to get to know the route at first. There's a ton out there, but that's a good place to start. Uh, any other questions? Again, it's fascinating when you think of a hundred years ago when this thing was started, you know, how it started as a one lane dirt road and that was the highway, you know, and now mm -hmm. we have I remember when I first moved out here to California from New York, I got out here and uh, got on a highway here, I think there's six lanes in each direction. And then also then had, you know, off ramps and all the rest of it. And I was, I remember being scared to death when I got to the far left thinking, how will I ever get back off this road to go off to the right? I mean, mm -hmm. so now, like I said, 12 lanes of concrete back then one. So things have changed so much, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, you know, as, as, as Don mentioned, the, you know, the, towns would bribe the uh you know the highway department uh you know they, they would pay the road but they would also bribe people to have the road rerouted mm -hmm. and there were all sorts of talk about bridges that fell down whether or not they were helped to fall down yeah that was some of that. do the thing so people are out literally hijacking the highway you know i mean they would build a section of road and then oh it's too bad the br bridge at bridgeport fell down i happen to have a highway here you can use and the highway crew happens to be standing by with the signs and the highway commissioner just happened to be driving a new car. I mean, it was amazing politics along that, that route. Fascinating reading if you go through it all. Well, and, and something you mentioned, it can't be overstated how important the route was, especially during its golden days. There was so much money going up and down that route that, yeah, a lot happened as people tried to get so that money to move through their town. Uh, and something else you mentioned earlier, and Bill and you and I talked about this the other day, uh, I mentioned the Jericho Gap. Uh, later on in the route, there are sections of this route when it was first started where it was a one lane dirt road, which were downright dangerous to drive. Uh, if when we do the second part, uh, just before we get to the town of Oatman, I'll, I'll show you uh, a mountain pass there uh, Bill, you saw it, I think, where there were cars piled up at the bottom of the canyon because people couldn't drive. There used to be professional drivers who waited at the bottom to drive your car through because it was so risky. So it was one lane, dirt roads, often not very good dirt roads on some very tricky terrain. And yeah, it was it was not easy to travel in its earliest days. Do you know why when they laid out the road, they picked such a southern route rather than go further north? Was it to avoid Weather. the Rocky Mountains? It was the weather. This road was available year round going up north. You know, the road would have to be closed. The road he mentioned the Oatman was really interesting because I went over it with my family and Don mentioned all these cars, ruins them down below. But some people were really entrepreneurs. They would have a booth down at the bottom. You know, we'll drive your car over the mountain for a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. People want to drive it. Well, they'd get halfway into this thing and now we'll drive your car the rest of the way, $10. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't run into that one. Yeah. Uh, some, something else, Bill, you're right about the weather. That was an important factor. Uh, there was one other factor. I didn't go into great details about how the road was founded, uh, but <laughs> the road was founded. One of the two men who, uh, who lobbied with the Highway Commission to get Route 66 going, one of them was from Tulsa, and he made darn well sure that the route would pass through Tulsa. Um, and mostly through Oklahoma. Mostly through Oklahoma, but through his town. He wanted the money. Uh, next time we do this, we're going to learn about uh, a section of the route that was bypassed because someone was angry about losing an election and wanted to punish the town that voted against him. You, so there yeah. are all sorts of reasons. For, yeah, but yet the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad went much further north, didn't it? Went up through northern Utah. Which yeah. railroad? The Transcontinental Railroad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. The one that followed most of the route uh, then was the uh, Rock Island line. And you see large stretches of it. 
Uh, an interesting thing, by the way, while we went through the desert is you can stop along the route and if there are train tracks nearby, you're going to see a train about every five minutes. I was amazed at how busy the rail lines are now. And, and Joey uh, has a, a question. Sure. <clears throat> that was <clears throat> that was fantastic, Don. Oh, thank you, Joey. Uh, I really, really I feel like I feel like I went down Route 66 without actually being there. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, when I saw uh, when I saw the Gemini Muffler Man, I thought it was the same one uh, that we had in New York, and Coney Island had one. Um, but uh, I was informed that it was uh, it was um, contracted from a company in Irvine, California. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not the same one, but there must have been multiple Gemini's. Oh, there uh, are. There are tons. There are tons places. of them. Sorry, go ahead, Joey. Sorry. Yeah, no, this particular one was, um, there's a picture of the set, well, the same design with the helmet. Uh, and it was a fixture in Coney Island from about 1967 to 1969. And uh, it always, is always showed in a photo with a World's Fair Lumineer right next to it, because hmm. uh, they got some of the lights. But um, I just thought it was fascinating to see him. Uh, and, um, and the other question I had, uh, what is the connection of James Dean to Route 66? Uh, is that the road that he crashed on? That he crashed in California on Dead Man's Curve. I do not believe Dead Man's okay. Curve is on Route 66. No, it, it was a different road, uh, uh, a probably different road. Okay. north of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. It's a okay. famous curve. Lots of accidents, but not Route 66, I'm afraid. Right, right. Well, thank you, Don. That, I, I have Wait, to go, but that was... Glenn? Yeah, but uh, James James Dean crashed on Highway 46. Ah, oh, right, uh, right in uh, Paso Robles. I see, I see. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, I have to go, and that was a. I'm looking forward to part two. Yeah, well, you thank you. I'm more forward to it. Well, great. Thank you, you for joining uh, us. I will have uh, uh, again work at the schedule for next week and post it. And again, this is where it's appreciated Don doing it. First of all, I could relax all week. I didn't have to go <laughs> and put together all the pictures. But it's the sort of thing, again, where, uh, again, I invite any of you, if you have a particular area of expertise or interest or something that you think the, uh, the group may, uh, you know, uh, uh, enjoy in a future presentation, please do uh, let us know. So if uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, people on the East Coast that mention, again, the routes that go through some of these small towns and, you know, like uh, Natchez Trace Highway, we did a number of years ago, was kind of a fascinating, uh, you know, section of road. Uh, you know, going through the Blue Mountain, Blue Ridge Mountains, things like that. Uh, again, if you, things people would like to, to do it, please uh, let me know, and uh, you know, we'll we'll be glad to work it out. So, Don, I want to thank you personally for taking the time and effort to put it all together. And now I've got this sudden desire to go have a root beer float and some apple pie. <laughs> uh, I want to I want to thank you for giving me the forum, but it's nice to be able to to share my photos with folks. So great, thanks. I hope everybody has a good week. And again, I will have a schedule available in the next day, the two days posted out there. Uh, will always be on the uh, the Zoom site. Uh, again, if you uh, want to get on my mailing list for the uh, invites or anything, just drop me an email or send me a note on uh, Facebook. And I'll, I'll add you to the weekly mailings that go out. Uh, Darren, were you trying to raise your hand? If so, he's muted. Yeah. I think he's typing. Uh, All right. Ah, there we go. Uh, first of all, thank you. Great presentation, Don. Um, Bill, when you post this on your website later, the link to the uh, uh, presentation. Can you put Don's recommended list list on there too? Yeah, I'll post this uh, on the uh, uh, website, and it will be uh, up there with uh, the other chats. Okay, okay, if you want, if you, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say if you could add Don's recommended reading list to that as well, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, uh, I will see what I can do to post that in there with the uh, the link for that. Thank you for the suggestion. It, it does, mm -hmm. Zoom does capture the chat and sticks it into a text file. So I'll see what I can do. If you go oh, right now, you. it is in the it's, it is in the chat at the moment. So you can do a quick cut and paste if you're quick. So. <laughs> Thank you. Quick, quick, go, go, go now. Nope. <laughs> We're timing you. <laughs>
Great. Okay. Well, uh, I will end this now and we will see uh, folks in the future. I hope everybody has a great week. Hey, thank what you, is guys. next I week again, Bill? It. What are you presenting? What What are you presenting next week? Next week, I don't know yet. It may be the 1939 World's Fair that this uh, woman wrote a very, uh, very nice book, a historical novel set at the 39 fair. Uh, and then I would uh, basically do, ha do half of that and then more uh, vintage photos of the 39 fair. We may be back to Route 66 and there's somebody else that's trying to juggle their schedule on the 64 fair. So I've got about three balls up in the air and we'll know within the next 48 hours. Okay, sounds good. I'm just, uh, I'll definitely be here. I was just wondering what was going to be on the air. So okay. looking forward to it. Great. Thanks all. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,